How do you get an endgame sized finale? By making it a finale for every version of the same series all at once. Spider-Man No Way Home managed to do the impossible and lived up to most people's increasingly outsized expectations. I will do this. Not only that, but they managed to hide in plain sight that this no origin story superhero franchise was the origin story the whole time. How did they pull this off? What part of making this movie wasn't figured out by the internet ahead of time? Let's ask those who made it. If there's one thing that Spider-Man's foes have tended to have in common on the big screen, aside from hating Spider-Man, it's a talent for chewing scenery. And no one seems to take as much joy in chewing scenery than Willem Dafoe. Who can get that image of the Green Goblin's evil grin out of their heads as he took those spider punches? In interviews, co-stars Holland and Zendaya comment on how many choices Dafoe would be able to give directors, which ended in them reshooting scenes over and over again, just to see if he'd ever run out of different ways to do the take. Part of his ability to dig into the depths of his character was his insistence that he also do the physical stuff, including stunts. In an interview with Mulderville, Defoe said that doing the physical stuff was a requirement before he had even read the script, saying that it was an important element of getting into and developing the character. I want to do the action because that's fun for me. And understandably, it's fun. Who doesn't want to cruise around on a goblin glider? Holland commented in an interview with Collider that after the two had finished filming a fight scene, both of them collapsed on the floor, having poured themselves into the scene, even getting Holland's knuckles bloody. It wasn't all high intensity on set. In fact, co-stars have remarked about how Defoe was able to switch back to being his sweet, lovable self as soon as they called cut. But he wasn't the only on-screen baddie that brought some lightness to the set. During setup changes on some of the days that the movies Electro were in, the multi-talented Jamie Foxx would hold his own dance parties with the producers and other actors. He's just such a nice guy. Were you um, there for the dance party? I wasn't there for the dance party. Even G&E would get in on the fun, setting up some dance lighting for their little parties. Here's a nugget for you to use at parties. G&E is Grips and Electric. Grips built the structure and apparatus for lights in production. Electric run the actual lights. They work under the gaffer, who designs the lighting assisted by the key grip for grips and best boy for electric. And now you know, which of course is half the battle. We'll tell you why it's called a honey wagon when you're older. There were two people notably missing from Fox's dance parties, stars Tom Holland and Zendaya. Zendaya revealed seriously in an interview that she had been asked not to visit set for a few days, in order to not distract production which was running behind. Since she felt her standing in the corner couldn't be what was holding things up, she came in eventually to find one of Fox's parties happening, with Holland adding that even he wasn't invited, and he's Spider-Man, in a Spider-Man movie. With one short of a Sinister Six villains returning from the other Spider-Man franchises, and two Spider-Men, sorry Nicholas Hammond, star of the short-lived 70s live-action series, maybe next time. Spider-Man No Way Home was chock full of more than just cameos. But there's one cameo that ended up on the cutting room floor, and it's one with a very personal connection to star Tom Holland, Harry Holland. Brother Harry had co-starred in the non-Spider-Man movie Cherry. The brothers had entertained the idea of inserting his brother's character into Tom's movies, and that started with a small part in No Way Home. They even got as far as filming the scene, with Holland sharing a behind-the-scenes photo with his brother on his Instagram page. But the movie was already getting long and Harry's cameo ended up not making the cut. The younger Holland can join Hammond, consoling each other for not making it to the final product. And my brother Harry is like, mate, you're Spider-Man, suck it up and get on with it, you'll be fine. Comic book adaptations have solidified the important role in the life of a superhero. Can I be your guy in the chair? What? While the superhero is out superheroing, the chair feeds them important information about the whereabouts of the bad guy, the status of the various first responders that come with having a super fight in a populated city, and if they can hack a few traffic lights, then all the better. Ned Leeds has been the MCU's man in the chair for Spider-Man since he caught Spidey crawling back into his room, destroying the Death Star for a third time. Maybe that's not the mega weapon it's meant to be. When Zendaya went for 60% sure to positive that Peter was Spider-Man, she joined the team, providing support for the superhero that also happens to be an awkward teenage boy. Team Spider-Man turns out to also be Team Holland as well, though. If you were wondering why Zendaya was showing up on days she wasn't filming, it's because she and Jacob Batalon, who plays Ned Leeds, were providing emotional support to Holland as he filmed some of the movie's more emotional scenes as so much of Peter's world came crashing down, both literally and metaphorically. To pull off the kind of eye-popping finale they did with No Way Home, secrecy was paramount, even if a lot of those secrets didn't stay secret. When Jamie Foxx announced his return as Electro, he posted an Instagram photo that also happened to feature three Spider-Men, launching a thousand interview questions where an exasperated Andrew Garfield had to pretend he wasn't in the movie he clearly was in. 
Villains accidentally saying the quiet part out loud aside, there were a few secrets that were held closer to the chest, including the very emotional moment where Aunt May filled the inspirational role usually reserved for Uncle Ben. Aunt May actor Marissa Tomei certainly felt the weight of her role, in that key scene that has her saying one of the most iconic lines in all of superherodom. But thanks to her agreement with Sony and Marvel, she couldn't talk to anyone about it. That is, until she found a loophole. Therapists are ethically forbidden from sharing things their patients reveal to them. So Tomei was able to talk to her therapist about that moment without it getting out in the world. And now that it has, we all might need a little therapy to get over Aunt May going the way of Uncle Ben. With all that intensity, it might take more than Jamie Foxx dance parties to lighten the mood on set, and Tom Holland was there to provide with his own brand of practical jokes. Holland told the story of one joke of opportunity he was able to pull on Mitch Bell, one of the producers on Spider-Man. On Seth Meyers, he characterized Bell's role as being the guy watching the money, so he took the job of preventing a shutdown from an outbreak seriously. To get in and out of the tight-fitting suit, costumers used a lubricant to squirt on the zipper when it would get stuck. Lubricant that came in a bottle suspiciously like a bottle of hand sanitizer. So when Bell came by and asked for a squirt of that hand sanitizer, Tom and Brother Harry decided to take the opportunity to not correct him, and instead watch him futilely try to rub it onto his hands. A lot of things have changed since the first time Alfred Molina donned the Doc Ock appendages. Most of it in the technology that movies are made with. For Raimi's appearance of the good doctor, the extra appendages were a practical effect operated by puppeteers on set. Now it's a more digital age and the legs could be added in post-production, after filming with digital effects. That still required Molina to move about the set as if he were being carried by his mechanical legs. And that required what they refer to as the toothpick rig, a long balanced crane that allowed him to be moved about on set. While this meant that he didn't have to work in cooperation with four different puppeteers at the same time, it didn't mean that he was the master of his own fate as the control of the crane was in the hands of the crew. This provided for some humorous moments between the actor, who is affable and friendly when he's not on camera menacing Spider-Man. During an appearance on Hot Ones, Holland revealed that he'd be talking about what part of England they're from and suddenly Molina would start floating off into position for the next shot. Hello, Peter. One of the biggest strengths of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies was his clear love for the character and his dedication to a near-picture-perfect adaptation. Part of that came in the form of casting, including the practically ripped from the page Rosemary Harris as Aunt May, and the too-perfect-to-be-believed casting of J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> The one foe that Spider-Man never can seem to defeat was a highlight of that first film series, and fans rightfully felt that he could not be replaced. So when he showed up in the end credits scene of Far From Home, fans were elated. While the MCU's J. Jonah has some changes, like being an online news outlet instead of a paper, and the iconic flat top was gone. Simmons, himself a fan of his iconic character, drew the line at the mustache and cigar though. Smoking is a no-no in the world's largest purveyor of children's entertainment, but the stash? That had to stay and Simmons fought to keep J. Jonah's iconic facial hair. All the returning cast members from other series had things they wanted in order to revisit their roles. Defoe and Molina were intent on not just being cameos that were nothing more than a cheeky nod to their former roles, but Fox had another request. No more blue. Not all comic book looks can translate to real-world costumes, usually in the form of elaborate cowls. Electro traditionally came with a lightning bolt design that surrounded his face. Rather than tackling that tricky translation, they went with the Earth 1610's version of the electric supervillain, who crackled with the electricity and giving him a blue hue. CGI'd electric blue comic book characters on the big screen have a tricky history, and Electro's look didn't go over that well, especially with the star who wanted to lose the blue for his return. For bonus points, they even found a way to momentarily replicate the cowl in a cool way. The returning villains and aliens in No Way Home did manage to be more than just cheesy cameos, instead playing pivotal roles in Peter Parker's transition from Boy Spider to Spider-Man, standing out of the shadow of Iron Man and the Avengers. Even J. Jonah played his usual role of making a difficult situation that much more difficult by inadvertently giving the Green Goblin the opportunity to take one more thing away from Peter. But while the other baddies had intense one-on-one -on -one scenes with Spider-Man and men, J. Jonah remained on the outside looking in, never actually meeting Holland during the shooting of the movie. Maybe he was invited to the dance parties, though. You think that Nicholas Hammond's Peter Parker from the TV show and Shinjo Toto's Spider-Man from the Japanese television adaptation were just wandering around New York and Tokyo respectively, never really knowing what was going on until they were blinked back to their dimensions? 